This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a wonderful guest on the phone with me today. Yes, we have the guy who played Douglas C. Niedermeyer in National Lampoon's Animal House, and they been a lot of other interesting films as well in music videos. I'm talking about the great, the talented Mark Metcalf. How are you, Mark? I'm good. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yes. It's, uh, I've got to send a little shout out to Steve uh, Joyner for hooking this up. I truly appreciate it. I love Animal House. But i got to say this to um, our station manager here, Aaron, uh, when she found out that I was interviewing you, she is the biggest Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. I uh, just, yeah. Yeah. I just, she would be, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering yeah, if no, you. It, uh, it was it was a huge hit for, uh, especially for women of a certain age. Yeah. <laughs> Well, she's out on uh, fraternity leave right n- right now, and uh, I just wonder if you do a little shout out to her. Sure. What's an Aaron? Yeah, Aaron. Aaron. Sure. Hello, Aaron. <laughs> She'll Got be delighted. I, I, uh, you're my ninety um, fifth interview I've done on this podcast since two thousand fifteen. She said this was the first one she was jealous of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I played the master in the first season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, considered one of the big dads from Buffy, which just had its, I think, 20th anniversary just uh, of the first episode of Buffy the Vampire just uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder why Flounder is complaining so much. You went kind of easy on him compared to Buffy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, at least he got to live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I gotta say, we we love Douglas C. Niedermeyer, and I gotta say, you were a standout in that film. I just wondered uh, how you got the part for that. Was it just a standard audition? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it wasn't a standard audition, but it was an audition. I auditioned like everybody else, but I uh, uh, to kind of a good story. I uh, was called to come in and audition for the part. That Tim Matheson ended up playing uh, f- uh, Otter, yeah, and which I thought would be a fun part because he got all the girls and it would be fun to rehearse and play that part. And as soon as I walked into the room with John Landis and Michael Chinich, who cast it, John looked at me and said, "Do you know how to ride?" <laughs> and I'd read the script because my agent had gotten me the script. I would just, so I knew what he was talking about, and I said, "Of course, I know how to ride. I was practically born on a horse." My uh, mother's water broke when she was out on a trail ride in our ranch in Montana, and she slid off, and my father delivered me right in the shade of the horse. And we got back on the horse and rode into back to the, down to the ranch. And Landis looked at me and said, yeah, right. And I told him five more lies about how I knew how to ride uh, since I was a child. And uh, the next day he called me and said, I want you to do this part. I said, great, John. Can you get some money from Universal so that I can take riding lessons? And I uh, went to uh, Central Park, a little German woman in Central Park at Claremont Stables. And I'd ridden before, and I knew how to ride, but I didn't know how to like really ride. And she taught me English. Okay. We worked on it. So that's how I got cast. I never had to really I just met with John and talked to him a little bit. I didn't have to read from the script. It was fun. That's the way to get parts. It's kind of interesting, too, because originally I heard when they were cast in that film, I mean, they got John Belushi, but I heard Otter was tailored for Chevy Chase, uh, D-Day was tailored for Dan Aykroyd, and Boone was tailored for Bill Murray. Did you hear anything about that? Well, yeah, it was that was an early idea of people, and it was something that some people wanted. Universal particularly wanted it. They wanted to sort of make it, pack it with as many people that were known as possible. John Landis wanted to avoid that. He wanted John Belushi to be free of any kind of former influences, prior influences, so that he would maybe run amok. And uh, didn't want any stars. He really wanted an ensemble. He He thought that the movie would work best 
if it uh, if it had just all unknown actors without a lot of ego and a lot without a lot, a lot without a lot a lot to lose and uh, to everybody who could just work on the same level and also good actors who could really sort of help John you know make that little bit of transition from sketch comedy artist to actor. So and I'm sure that it was in somebody's mind. I mean, at some point, somebody wanted Jack Webb to play Dean Vernon. Uh, I had heard Danny to play Niedermeyer and, and or D-Day. Uh, I know Harold Ramis wanted to be in it, and he was one of the writers. But he thought of himself as an actor. He wanted to play Boone, and John didn't want that. Again, as I say, he wanted all people that were unknown to the audience, so they didn't bring anything any prior knowledge, and I, I, which I think was by far the best decision. If he'd have been packed with a bunch of stars, it would have been filled with a bunch of bits and shtick and familiar stuff that they did, and uh, it might not have hung together as a film, as a story. I agree. I think in a way, it does. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering what what your what were your memories of John Belushi? Of course, he played Bluto, who got zero point zero. Right, right. Uh, John it was great to work with John. He's a really good actor. I mean, he really responded in moment. A great physical comedian, and uh, that's probably the question I get the most: is what was it like to work with John Belushi? And I always think the subtext is. How how messed up was he? How crazy was he? How because of the way he died and and what's left behind in Bob Woodward's book is the stories of uh, of the drugs. That was I mean, it's a big story in the eighties. The drugs everybody took, but on Animal Mouse, he was very clean, very professional. Showed up to work on time every day. He was working hard. He was fly back to New York on Thursday, I think, to do, to rehearse and to perform Saturday Night Live, and then he would come back to us late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, or uh, sometimes Sunday, so that he could work again on Monday. And uh, so he was, he was really, he really had to pay attention. And Judy Belushi, now Judy Pisano, uh, was, his wife was with him, and uh, she's actually in the movie. I can't. She plays a co-ed somewhere. I'm not sure where exactly she is in the movie. But uh, but so John was John was great to work with. I mean, it's always good to work with good actors because you knock the ball across the net and, and they knock it back in an interesting way. Yeah. Well, Douglas C. Niedermeyer kind of stands out on his own there. Um, I think of, out of all the Omegas. Uh, I think Niedermeyer, to me, is the most notable. Um, did how how did you come about to do that part? Like, was there how did you prepare for that? Because that was a well, very funny part. Yeah, it was. I, I knew it when I read it, the script originally that it was. And a couple of other friends of mine, Bruce McGill, is an old friend of mine. When he found out I had it, he I had that part. He uh, he said. That's the best acting part in the movie, and uh, and he's right, and I knew that. It's it's always good to play uh, a bad guy, as it were. Although you just you never play him as though he's a bad guy. You play him as though he wrote the movie. I always uh, I always feel Niedermeyer was the great misunderstood center of the movie, and so you prepare it that way. I mean, you prepare him as being always right and justifiable. And uh, what I did was. Uh, learned how to ride because the horse I felt was the most intimate relationship he had in his life and maybe he would ever have. Um, so I learned how to ride and as soon as the horse got there I made a I spent as much time with the horse as I could and I also uh, Landis did an interesting thing for all of us because he could because we were actors he really separated us the Omegas and the Deltas he had the Deltas arrive uh, for three or four or five days early, they bonded. They went to a couple of fraternity parties and they just all got together, rehearsed. And, and then when I arrived, I got off the plane and to the production office and got my per diem, the money I need for food every day. 
and they told me, John wants to see you in the coffee shop across the parking lot at the Roadway Inn in Springfield, right outside of Eugene, Oregon. So I left my bags in the production office and walked across the parking lot and went into this big coffee shop uh, looking for John. And I saw him in a corner booth, in a big booth, with a whole bunch of people. And McGill was there, and I'd known McGill, as I say, from New York. Uh, I knew Peter Riegert vaguely from New York. And all these guys were sitting there around John having, and John was there, Belushi. I'd met him once before. And uh, John waved at me and said, come on over. And I walked across in this crowded parking uh, uh, coffee shop. And as soon as I got about 10 feet away from him, Landis looked at me and uh, pointed and said, that's him. That's Niedermeyer. Get him. Oh. And everybody started throwing food and calling me asshole and generally <laughs> humiliating me right in the front of the, in the middle of the coffee shop in front of everybody, which was sort of the opening salvo. It was the the uh, the cannon at Fort Sumter, perhaps, and that started the civil war between the two of us, uh, the two houses. And and I knew exactly what I had to do from that point on. I stayed away from those guys. They had a party room that was in McGill's room. McGill found a uh, upright piano and rolled it across to the uh, parking lot, put it in his room, and that was party room, and they would party there every night uh, till early in the morning. And uh, I had the hotel move my room, so it was right above McGill's room. And uh, so I couldn't ever get to sleep, so I'd stay up late at night polishing my boots, spit polishing my boots with a candle and boot polish and uh, and studying my script and getting madder and madder and madder at these guys down below who were so frivolous, wasting their lives, having fun. And uh, so that was my preparation, very kind of method actory stuff. I tend to do that. Yeah, Kevin Bacon relayed something like this to uh, Howard Stern, that uh, he was in a similar position where he was kind of kept away. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, he didn't. He didn't. Uh, almost everybody was on the set for the whole, um, I think, 32 days is what we shot in. And I was there for about 30 days. And Kevin came later he was because uh, he wasn't shot right away. So he was one of those. Another thing that Landis did, a lot of times actors will just come and shoot the two or three days that their part is needed for. But on this, Landis had everybody there the whole time because, again, he wanted this bond and this uh, tension between the two houses. He wanted that to be a really vile thing, so we all stayed. And Kevin was there at less time. I don't think he was there for the full 32 days. They brought him in and shot out. And they brought, might, have, might have even brought him back for the uh, parade scene at the end. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. Funny seeing him get remember. paddled. <laughs> what? It's funny seeing him get paddled. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say the uh, we were a low budget picture, so we didn't take do very many takes of each shot, except for that one when I'm paddling Kevin. Uh, Landis claims that he did 18 takes of that because he'd love to see the look on my face and the look on Kevin's face, uh, face as he's being uh, whacked on the back. Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> Yeah. Um, was uh, the two women treated the same way? Uh, Mary Louise Weller and Martha Smith, both gorgeous women. Um, yeah. yeah. Were they treated the same way as the Omegas? Yeah, they were They were kept out on their own. I mean, they were sort of happy to be. I think Martha was married at the time to uh, a fellow who, I can't remember, his, uh, his father was Mel Blank. I think he did Bugs Bunny's voice. So she had she had a little bit of celebrity just because she was familiar to Mel Blank. But she and she and Mandy Babs and Mandy uh, Martha and the Mary Louise pretty much stayed on their own. I did a lot. Of, I rode horses with Mary Louise several times because I I found a ranch on the edge of town that would let me exercise their horses. They had ponies that they cow ponies that they just used to run the cattle uh, up into the hills in the summertime and bring them down in the fall and it was fall and they'd been they'd been used they were no longer needed so they didn't ride them they just left them out in the pasture so they just would give me a halter and I'd go out there and saddle one up and go riding and Mary Louise came riding with me a couple of times and yeah they were I guess they might have uh, 
I don't know. I don't know. I didn't follow, I didn't spend too much time with him because, as I say, my uh, my most intimate relationship was with my horse. <laughs> Uh, uh, outside that, um, you had a relationship of sort, uh, the opposite end, <laughs> the aggressive end, with poor Stephen F- First as Flounder. <laughs> yes, well, I did have, yeah, there was a sort of a, a certain intimacy in, in sadism, yes. There is. <laughs> I like it when you yeah, just... Yeah, Stephen, uh, Stephen had become a really good friend, and at the time... It was, uh, he was very heavy. Uh, it, it, right after, soon after Ann Wiles, he discovered he had diabetes and he really did a great job. I mean, he's been a great spokesman for di- diabetes uh, all of his life and he's lost a lot of weight and really gotten himself in shape and, and uh, is having a very, he directs a lot, produces films, directs a lot, and uh, of course he did St. Elsewhere and then he did uh, Babylon 5, he's had a really good long long busy career uh because he paid attention to the fact that he had diabetes and he and he worked to overcome it but he was heavy and so he was easy to uh to ridicule and and he he was great he had a kind of pathos about him he uh the legend is that he got this part and i guess it's probably true he was delivering pizza at the time when they were casting and he uh they called, happened to call the place that he was delivering pizzas for and ordered pizza into the casting office, and he brought it and taped to the inside of the pizza box was his 8.5 uh, by 11, his resume picture. So that was how he sort of got himself into the into the mix in terms of being cast because he was not the actor, the kind of actor. or the He didn't have the position in the industry that ordinarily people, want everybody even back then people wanted well-known people to bring fanny put fannies in the seats and but as i said john wanted not so well-known people he wanted good actors who were just right for the part he had that vision what was your memories of uh john vernon who was so great at playing dean warmer yeah john was john was a great good man he was really good he was there he was the first person well, let's see. Landis says that everybody also wants to know, did you know it was going to be such a big hit when you made it? No, of course not. Nobody knew, really. We were just doing a job. It was a good job. But John Vernon apparently had read it and uh, called John and said, this is going to make a whole lot of money. This is going to be a big hit. And uh, as I said, I think Universal wanted Jack Webb from Dragnet to do it. But John, like John Vernon, he'd seen him in Outlaw, Outlaw Josie Wales. And he had the great eyes and a great face, and uh, and he cast him. And John was a great champion of the movie for the longest, yeah, for a long time. Really, he had a great time doing it. Because he didn't get asked to do that kind of comedy very often. He did things like Point Blank, great movie with great, great movie with uh, Lee Marvin and Outlaw Josie Wales. He played heavies, bad guys, and didn't get asked to do that. A comedy, and he knew how. He, he obviously knew how to do it. He played, it. and you don't do it any differently than you do the other parts. It's just sometimes it's a little more fun. One big name that was in it, though, uh, was Donald Sutherland playing one of the professors that didn't want to be there. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, the Universal kept insisting and insisting and insisting that they there be a movie star in it. And Landis knew Donald from, yeah, I think he'd worked on Dirty Dozen with him in Romania. And uh, so he knew him from there. And Donald, he knew Donald was in San Francisco shooting a movie called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a remake of the old Kevin McCarthy film with uh, Brooke Adams. Yep. And he uh, called Donald and said, will you be in this movie for me? They insist that I want a movie star. I'll write a part, I have a, write a part in, you'll be a professor. It'll be really nice. It'll be right up your alley. It'll take you one day, one and a half days to shoot it. We'll fly you up here on Friday if you can get off work. We'll shoot you on Saturday, and you can be back there on Sunday so you can shoot again on Invasion of the Body Snatchers on Monday. And Sutherland finally said, well, all right. And Landon said, I don't know, money. I don't know. What we can do is we can give you, like, I don't know what the numbers were really, but $10,000 for the whole thing that's to fly up for one day shoot one day and then fly back the next day 
uh, or I can give scale, which was I think twelve hundred bucks a week at that time, or twelve hundred bucks would have been twelve hundred bucks for the three days, or and give you a couple of, a point in the movie, or or a half a percentage point of the movie. And Southern said, "Oh no, I'll take the cash. I'll take the cash." And at last uh, calculation, apparently, if he'd taken the points, he would have made eight million dollars or something. Oh. <laughs> that he took out the ten thousand dollars, but he was land assault. He says the two highest paid creatures on the movie were Donald Sutherland and my horse. <laughs> they, were, they were paid more than anybody else. Everybody else worked for scale, except Matheson probably worked for a little above scale. And of course, uh, Doug scale is what. The, in case people don't know, is what the union says the le- the minimum amount you can pay a person is. Of course, Doug Kenny, no longer with us, played Stork, was uh, one of the Lampoon writers, uh, was yeah. in it. Do you have any memories of him? Oh, yeah, I spent quite a bit of time with Doug. He, uh, he told me that he patterned Niedermeyer after his brother, who had died uh, at a young age, and I can't remember how, I think, I'm not sure if it was a car accident or what, but some kind of horrible, tragic death at a very young age and that he patterned uh, he told me he patterned Niedermeyer after his brother so there I felt like there was a and he felt like there was a kind of a special bond between Niedermeyer and he had a, he had a special place in his heart for Niedermeyer which I think is probably one of the reasons that Niedermeyer keeps rising to the surface as one of the important characters in the movie is not not really so much because of what I did but because of the way it was written where it was written from. I mean, it was uh, uh, all three of them. Doug, Doug, who really initiated the idea. Chris Miller, who brought a lot of the uh, fraternity stories in because he'd been in a fraternity at Dartmouth that was really was the Delta House and, and had written stories for the National Lampoon about it. And then Harold Ramos, who is very, was, he has also passed away. Yeah. Um, just a year or so ago, uh, who was a very, very well-ordered, very, really, really smart, great guy with a great sense of humor, but he kind of helped keep things in order. This, the script originally was about Charles Manson in high school, oh. and, and everybody recognized that there was kind of a genius in it, but it was it was way too dark uh, to go that way. So after many. Uh, evolutions and writers conferences it, they arrived they had to put it in college because they said you can't do this to high school kids so they made it college and and got chris to write the all the you know come up with a lot of stories for the characters from both delta house and omega house but doug yeah doug was a great a great guy i mean a really really one of the smartest people I mean, he and mike nichols are probably the two smartest people i've ever worked with and uh yeah, I just made a movie last summer called A Futile and Stupid Gesture, which yeah. was based on a book by the same net title uh, about Doug Kenny, basically about his life. Okay. I mean, until he uh, sailed off the cliff in Hawaii. I also heard rumor that uh, Karen Allen, who, of course, played Boone's girlfriend in the movie, this led to her being in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Well, it, it probably did. It was her first movie. It was everybody's first movie. Matheson had done some television before, and John was on Saturday Night Live. I'd done a movie called Julia with uh, Jane, Jane Fonda and, Julia and uh, Vanessa Redgrave, but I'd been cut out of it uh, before it hit the screen. My name's still in the, in the credits, but it was pretty much everybody's first movie credit. So it was Karen's movie. So you could say that it led to everything else that happened in Karen's life, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Starman with Jeff Bridges. I mean, she's a beautiful woman and a, and a wonderful actress and uh, really nice to hang around with. So, uh, yeah, I flew out on the airplane from New York to Eugene with her, and by the time I got there, I was totally in love with her, yeah. as everybody was to met her, because she was just so beautiful and so such, such a, a good, big, open heart. Yeah, I have to touch on briefly here because uh, we're starting to get a low on time. But 
I think you were the reason the Twisted Sister videos took off. They can, you know, as talented as Dee Snyder is, I think you were so awesome in in the Twisted Sister videos. In fact, they even brought Thanks. Stephen first back in, in for one of them. Yeah, yeah, the second one they got Stephen there to to, hit, to finally get to hit me with the uh, spritzer bottle. Yeah, after everything else. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, uh, thank you. That's very nice. I mean, it was they're, they're great concepts, the kind of Roadrunner cartoon concept for a video. Everybody was doing, you know, busty, sexy girls dancing, and I, I, I didn't even know what MTV was. I didn't even own a television at the time when they asked me to do it in the mid-'80s. And probably more people have seen that work than anything else, even when, than Animal House, possibly, because it played every five minutes on MTV, it seemed like. And then Tipper Gore, when she did her hearing some second drugs and violence and rock and roll, played one of them, the first one, in its entirety on the floor of the Senate. So I'm in the, my work is in the Senate record book. Yeah. But it was fun to do. I mean, they, they, they're smart guys. Dee was a really smart guy, great, phenomenal self promoter. One of the ugliest people I've ever met, I think, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, but a nice guy. And uh, when they picked me up at the airport, I did it for no money at all because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if anybody would see it. I didn't care. I wanted to. I was doing a play in New York. I wanted to get a trip back to LA to pick up some stuff out of an old girlfriend's apartment that I'd left there. And took a trip to LA and uh, uh, I got off the plane. D picked me up and he was like this. He's like six four or something. He's a big guy. And uh, it looks like a big puppy dog. He thinks Niedermeyer is so great and so great. He'd use Niedermeyer's, some of Niedermeyer's lines and tact. And he rides me to Marty Colner's house, the director's house, which is where I stayed. They put me up to sleep on a couch in Marty Colner's studio, um, in his uh, recording studio there. And, uh, and then he said, as I drove in, he said, okay, so this is the thing. It's like a Roadrunner cartoon. The band just abuses you. They blow you through walls. But before that all happens, you yell at your son for like a full minute, and we want you to write that for us, okay? <laughs> so I had to go home and write all that dialogue, uh, or I got to go visit a friend, uh, Rex Weiner, and visit had visited with him, and he and I together uh, wrote the dialogue for that uh, for the old one. I'm yelling at my son. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, but I mean, no money, and those guys are all living in big houses on Long Island with indoor swimming pools and gyms and everything. And that I went big, back to my apartment on the Lower East Side in you know, Manhattan. That big famous, so <laughs> big famous line. What are you gonna do with your life? What are you gonna do? With your life? I have people used to want me to yell at them in the streets of New York, <laughs> and uh, and weren't happy if I didn't spit on them. Oh. Yell, what do you want to do with your life? And they say, no, 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 you just spit on me, spit on me. It was pretty funny. Well, you've had quite the career, even outside Animal House, like other crits, like Where the Buffalo Roam, and, uh, One um, One Crazy Summer, and Heavenly Kid, and you know? Yeah, I've, I've worked a lot, yeah, and that's... And I haven't. I've done. I really haven't done much of anything for the last almost 15, 17 years. I guess I pretty much retired in two thousand, and uh, would do some work for. I continued. I did an episode, a couple of episodes, or an episode of Angel, and another episode of Buffy, and I would go back and forth when they called me. But then, you know, if they if anybody asked for me, they didn't ask for me. I did a couple of films, a really nice little film called Little Red, that's uh, on Amazon and. Uh, uh, YouTube and a bunch of places on the uh, internet. So I think a very nice movie. And I made a another film we called uh, Depth of Field that isn't out yet. Uh, it should come out some this year, I expect, in the fall. Uh, that I think is a pretty good movie made by a really nice young director named Tate Bunker. who's in Wisconsin. When I retired or semi-retired, I moved to Wisconsin for a restaurant. Did you and, like uh, with my wife? Did you like working with Bill Murray and Where the bu uh, Buffalo Roam? <laughs> I like it. Oh, yeah. stuck. Oh, sure. Billy's good to work with. I worked with him twice. I worked with twice. I worked with him on Where the Buffalo Roam, and then uh, did a play up the Hudson River Valley in uh, Hyde Park with him, uh, a Brecht play, in the man he hadn't done. 
much theater and a man that I, I knew who's also dead now, Tim Mayer, great okay. director out of Harvard, who's actually was a good friend of Doug Kenny uh, at Har- when they were both at Harvard together. Uh, he asked Billy to do A Man's a Man, this great Breck play with a lot of Kurt Vile music in it. And Susie Channing, Soccer Channing was in it, and I was in it, Bill was in it. Uh, Garrett Graham, a bunch of people were in it. And uh, we just, we had a good summer up there. <laughs> That play. So I worked with Billy several times. Yeah, that was funny. You pulled that poor woman in front of you when he let that fire extinguisher <laughs> gentleman move. I have two. Oh, I, oh is that? Oh, I see. I, I don't remember that. It's from uh, where the Buffalo Roam. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Billy, there's a place where Billy hits me. My character, I play. It was somebody patterned after Ron Ziegler, I think Nixon's, uh, it was actually, was Nixon's uh, press secretary. And there's a point where Billy Murray's character, who plays Hunter Thompson, hits me in the face. And uh, I wanted to rehearse it, and Billy said, no, let's just shoot the rehearsal. Go ahead. And he uh, he actually hit me. <laughs> he hit me right in the face. He didn't, uh, you're supposed to miss, and I'm supposed to uh, turn my head and, some, they, they put in a noise afterwards in, in the mix later, but uh, he extended his reach a little bit and caught me right across the nose. Didn't oh. break anything, but uh, he's kind of a wimp when it comes to hitting, but he did hit me. Before I let you go, I got two things I want to ask. Number one, and I hope this is not too much to ask, but could you do a little Niedermeyer for us? <laughs> well, a Niedermeyer? You mean a really small Niedermeyer? Like, uh, oh, uh, yell, yell like Niedermeyer. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Uh, um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, I, because of, as you know now, because I've told you the kind of actor I am, that's a little difficult, but, uh, um, you're worthless and weak. Drop and give me 20. I don't want to wake the people up in the house here, so I'm not going to yell too much. <laughs> You'll have to just imagine that you have spit all over you. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You, you're you wonderful in that movie. I, I be, Before I uh, did this interview yesterday, I actually watched Final Terror, and you actually got the girl in that until you, till something yeah, bad I got happened. Yeah, but then I had my genitalia separated from my body at the moment of orgasm. That, that, you just can't win, can you? <laughs> Uh-uh. No. Well... No, movie... Bad things happen in movies. Yeah. Yeah, Cindy Harrell. That was, yeah. That was a good cast. A good move, Good little movie. They totally messed it up later on. Yeah. Cutting it and recutting it. Yeah. Yeah, you had uh, longer hair, too. Yeah, my hair's not too pretty long now. <laughs> yeah, but longer hair than certainly when I was doing Niedermeyer. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, I was wondering if you would mind doing a plug for my show. Uh, what do I have to do? Just uh, state your name and um, say that you played Douglas C. Niedermeyer in Animal House. And uh, my sh- my name is Greg Gilbert, and my show Greg is... Greg what? What's the last one? Gilbert. Gilbert? Greg Gilbert. Okay. Yeah. And my show is called Python's Paradise. Python like the snake. Yeah. And I'm from okay. my I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. I don't know if you've been up this way before, but uh, I haven't made it all the way to New Brunswick. Some great brook trout up there, though, that I've always wanted to go up and catch. My father was up there once and uh, caught a whole bunch of really nice brook trout. Oh wow! Wouldn't mind seeing Niedermeyer take it the trailer part, boys. Now that would be something interesting. <laughs> well, he... good luck. <laughs> like uh, yeah, this. sure. This is Mark Metcalf. I played Douglas C. Niedermeyer in the, animal, in the movie Animal House. And uh, I'm here with Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise, up at, coming out of, beaming to you out of New Brunswick, Canada. New Brunswick, Canada, is that right? That is right. Yeah. Is that what you want, that kind of thing? That sort of thing, yep. You yep. want me to do it again? Go ahead, sure, why not? Okay. Hey, this is Mark Metcalf. I played Douglas C. Niedermeyer in the movie Animal House. I'm here with Greg Gilbert, and I'm coming to you from New Brunswick, Canada, on the Python's Paradise. 
Mark, thank you so much for coming on to the show today and reliving the memories. We loved you as Niedermeyer, and you stole the Twisted Sister videos. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good time up there. Bye-bye. Yep, God bless you.